Thank you for joining us for the Safety Center's November webinar entitled Rural Roadway Departure Countermeasures Part 2. My name is Jamie Sullivan and I am the manager for the National Center for Rural Road Safety. I'm going to take a moment here and close all these polls around the outside and give you a little bit of information about who's joining us today. It does look like we have about 36% of you joining us from the Western U.S., about 36% from the Midwest. And then we have about 13% from the Northeast and 11% from the Southeast today. And just a few of you from um, other locations as well. As far as how many people are joining us from your location, we have about 75% of you joining us on your own. And then the rest of you are joining us in groups. And when we do move over to the presentation, I'll give those of you in groups a little bit more information about letting us know who is um, joining with you. As far as what organizations you're coming from today, it looks like 30% are from local transportation departments, about 27% from state transportation departments. Um, we have about 2% from other local, federal, or state agency, about 2% from public lands agencies, and about 5% from federal transportation department today. We also have about 9% um, of you from universities and educational institutions, about 2% from professional associations, and 22% of you are consultants. And lastly, the majority of you, about 80%, are joining us by computer only. If you are joining us computer only and do have any audio issues today, we would ask you uh, that as a backup to please try dialing in. Sometimes we do have some audio issues with the internet results. Um, you can find the phone number in the top left-hand corner of your screen if you do need that. You can also use the chat pod, which is in the left-hand side of your screen, in order to talk with um, Dana, who is helping us today with the technology. And just a few more webinar logistics for you. Um, as always, our webinar today will be an hour and a half long and is being recorded so that it can be available on our website. That will be available in about a week. If you are listening by the phone, we would ask you to please mute your computer so you don't have any feedback. We will have quite a few graphics and videos in today's presentation. So if you would like to make your screen full screen in order to be able to see just the presentation and get rid of some of the extraneous stuff around the outside, you can use those four arrows that are pointing outward, and it's in the top right-hand corner of your screen. At the end of each section today, there will be time for question and answers. Uh, we, you can put your questions into the chat pod on the left side of the screen at any time, and when we, do stop, um, when we do stop for questions, I will read those questions out to our speakers. There's also a handout pod in the bottom left hand of your screen. That handout pod today has a copy of the presentation, um, a PDF version of that if you would like to download that. That PDF version will also be available when we post um, the streaming video on our website. Any of you that were joining us in the groups, there were quite a few of you, if you could please send the group list to info, I-N-F-O, at ruralsafetycenter.org. Uh, that will allow us to send you our surveys. We do have two surveys that follow up each webinar. The first survey will come out directly following today's webinar, and that one will be how you can request CEUs or certificates of completion for the webinar. Um, and then in about three months, we will send a follow-up email to you as well. Uh, and that survey will contain much fewer questions, about three to five, just trying to figure out what you've done with the information today. Perhaps you've passed it along to a colleague. Perhaps you have done uh, some sort of countermeasure um, implementation based on today's webinar. So that's the kind of stuff we're looking for from that second survey. So for today's survey, just because sometimes it does end up in people's uh, junk mail, we do also include the link in the webinar. So this, um, this slide does have the link at the very top. Again, that is available in the handout section as well. The surveys close two weeks after the webinar. It generally takes us about three to four weeks to manually create all of these certificates and get them emailed out to you. Um, for any of you who are waiting on previous webinar surveys, or, or I'm sorry, previous webinar CEUs, they have started going out this morning and will continue throughout the day after today's webinar. 
Um, anyone who is looking for CEU forms, you will send those back to continuing ed at montana.edu and not the Safety Center. It is a different group within Montana State University that does handle those CEUs for us. And if you're interested in finding out what CEUs you do have for all of our webinars that you've requested them from, you can request a verification of completion form. And on the screen now, in the bottom right-hand corner, you should see an example of what that verification and completion looks like. It will provide you with the name of the webinar that you requested them for and how many CEUs and how many hours that is um, for. And so for any of them that you have requested from us, that information, it will all be in that one form. Today's webinar is co-hosted by the Federal Highway Administration and by the Everyday Counts uh, Rural Roadway Departures Innovation, by the National Association of County Engineers and their Safety Committee, and also by the Safety Committee for the National LTAP and TTAP Association. Today's pre presenters, we have Keith Knapp and Tori Brinkley. And I'm going to read you their bios real quickly. So Keith Knapp is um, part of the Iowa Local Technical Assistance Program and the Institute for Transportation at Iowa State University. He is the director of the Iowa LTAP and he also serves as part of the National Rural Road Safety Center. He has more than 25 years of experience in transportation related training, outreach and extension, and research. He has developed and been an instructor in local, state, and national training courses with a wide range of subjects and has taught traffic engineering, safety, and highway design at various universities. He is a registered professional engineer. Tori is a safety engineer with the FHWA Resource Center Safety and Design Technical Services team. She has over 25 years of experience in highway safety and has spent the last 17 years with the FHWA Western Federal Lands Division providing technical assistance and outreach to the Forest Service, National Park Service, and other transportation agencies. Tori is certified NHI instructor and works with other resource center team members to create, update, and present training on a variety of roadside and highway safety topics. She is also a registered professional engineer. Our goal for today's webinar is that once you have completed this webinar, you will learn about various roadway marking and signing treatments with a focus on horizontal curves and how high friction surface treatments can help keep vehicles on the road. In order to learn this goal, we have several learning outcomes for you. The first is to summarize what the MUTCD says about pavement mar markings and horizontal curve signs to describe some of what we know about the potential safety benefits of pavement markings and horizontal curb signing, to describe the role of friction in roadway departures, to identify effective methods to improve friction, and to describe the safety benefits of high friction surface treatments. And before we jump into those learning outcomes, um, I'm going to pass the webinar over to Keith Knapp, who's going to talk to you a little bit about rural roadway departures. Keith? Thanks, Jamie, uh, and I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, yeah, before we jump into pavement marking, signing, high friction, I wanted to just have a few slides here uh, describing kind of why we're looking into rural roadway departures in general. So uh, between 2014 and 2016, there are you know, about 35,230 fatalities, and about half those were, were rural. And uh, a third of those were actually rural roadway departures, uh, again, in the United States over those three years on average, uh, per the federal highway definition of what a runoff the road, uh, rural runoff the roadway crash is, which is going left, right, and basically leaving your lane. So again, not a small problem, something that needs to be addressed and one of the reasons we're, we're looking at uh, rural roadway departures. Three different ways to kind of address these things. One is to keep vehicles on the roadway. One's to reduce the potential for the crashes. And the third is to minimize the severity of the crash. Um, we're going to be looking into the uh, keeping the vehicle on the roadway part. And there's three strategies in general that are being, uh, have, been, have been talked about or will be talked about. One is the improved curve delineation. Uh, again, fancy way of saying signing and marking. Uh, is one strategy to keep vehicles on the roadway, and I'm sure there are others. Um, friction treatments, 
in the on the curves and other spots. That's what Tori is going to be talking about. And again, I apologize if you can't, I'm literally two feet from my my phone at this point, talking as loudly as I can. So if there's a, we got to redo this, let me know. Uh, but I'm doing the best I can. Uh, the third treatment is, of course, edge line, shoulder line, shoulder and center line rhombal strips. And um, this was something that was talked about in the webinar uh, last month, and those are recorded. So uh, you can go back and take a look at that. So today we'll be talking about kind of the, the first two bullet points there. So uh, Jamie mentioned the first two uh, outcomes. Those are the ones related to the METCD, and I'll be repeating some of the METCD in the first few slides on pavement markings and signing. And the way the approach is going to go is talk about pavement markings and the METCD, talk a little bit about the safety issues or what we know about safety with the METCD, then talk about what it says about curve signing in the METCD, and then, again, safety impacts of signing or what we know. Uh, I'll throw this out there. There's the Highway Safety Manual. Uh, has some of these things in it. Uh, that's from 2010. And, of course, now we're eight years out on that, and I know they're updating that. Um, and the uh, CMF Clearinghouse, Crash Modification Clearinghouse. I'll bring that up a number of times. And what I'll throw out there for you on that is the percent reductions that I'm showing there, you know, there's many, many crash modification factors, crash reduction factors in the, uh, in the CMF clearinghouse. What you want to do, of course, is use the ones that are most relevant to your situation, which usually means reading the abstracts or reading about what's behind those numbers and understanding what's behind those numbers. So there's often nothing special about the, the percentages I'm showing. Uh, so use those other resources, again, as your reference versus the slides, if you will. Same thing with the METCD. That's your reference. Uh, I transcribe some of these things onto some slides. Everybody makes mistakes, that kind of thing. So you want to use that reference. Plus, there's much more on pavement marking and signing clearly in the METCD than the few slides you're going to see today. So moving on to pavement marking, keeping vehicles on the roadway. So the METCD, 2009 with 2012 adjustments or uh, revisions, uh, says certain things in 3B01 on yellow center line markings and warrants. Uh, those of you, again, that are familiar with the METCD uh, know that there's shall, should, may statements, uh, you know, standard statements, not standard statements, but should be done, uh, may statements, optional statements, that kind of thing. So what you want to do is read up on what all that means uh, along with support statements, and you'll see that the shell statements are in bold, and we've just repeated some of these on the yellow center line uh, from 3B01 here. You know, center line shall be placed on all paved urban arterials collectors with a travel weight greater than 20 feet, equal to or greater than, and equal to or greater than 6,000 average daily traffic. Uh, shall be placed on all paved two-way streets or highways with greater than or equal to three lanes for moving traffic. They should, the guidance again, should be placed on all urban arterials greater than 20 feet or 20 feet or more in width, ADT greater than or equal to 4,000 vehicles a day, should be placed on rural arterials and collectors greater than or equal to 18 feet, greater than or equal to 3,000 ADT, and should be placed on any other travel roadways where an engineering study indicates a need. Uh, judgment should be placed in when, when you have a travel way less than 16 feet, and again, that deals with the fact that you've got you know, there's only eight feet on each side of that, you're pushing, you might be pushing vehicles off the roadway or into oncoming traffic. So engineering judgment has to be taken into account when you're less than 16 feet. And of course, they may be placed on other paved travelways that are greater than or equal to 16 feet. So there's nothing new here. This was also, all these statements were also in the 2003 METCD. So they, these things have been around quite some time. And of course, we put center lines down for a number of reasons. Um, including operational and to keep people where they're supposed to be. So there's lots of really good reasons to put pavement markings down. They tend to have a really high benefit cost ratio, in my, my opinion. With regard to edge line, there's a shell on using them on freeways and expressways and rural arterials greater than or equal to 20 feet and an ADT greater than or equal to 6,000, 6, excuse me, uh, should be placed on rural arterials and collectors with a travel weight greater than 20 feet and greater than 3,080 T, 
and other paved streets and highways where a study indicates a need. Uh, once again, lots of good reasons to put edge lines down, and we'll talk a little bit about the, their safety impacts or what we know about that. Should not be placed where, again, it's going to decrease safety. Oops, I don't want to quite move on to that slide quite yet. But I will say this. You, as all of you that have dealt with the METCD know, there's lots more information on center lines and edge lines than what I just gave you in these few slides. So you're going to want to read up on those and the different optional statements and support statements that are out there. One example, again, of what we know about the safety impacts of edge lines and center lines comes out of the Highway Safety Manual. Oops, I seem to be missing a, a there's a little Highway Safety Manual at one point on the left on this slide. Uh, but uh, this one comes right out of the Highway Safety Manual from 2010, potential crash effects of placing edge lines and center line markings on rural, two-lane or multi-lane undivided highways, all types of crashes, injury crashes. You see a CMF of 0.76 there, which is a crash reduction factor of 24%, which again, given the cost of edge lines and center line markings, good high benefit cost there. With regard to edge lines, we have a Missouri case study that has been summarized uh, and used in the past. Uh, before 2008, MoDOT, uh, didn't stripe edge lines uh, for routes less than 1,000. And you can see the, the data from 2005 to 2007 here. Uh, they had about 35,000 line miles, uh, less than 1,000 ADT. And you can see the fatalities and injuries that were occurring on those roadways. Uh, and about 13,000 of that 35,000 uh, was actually below 1,000 uh, ADT, from about 400 to 1,000. And about two-thirds of those fatalities occurred on that 13,000 line miles. Uh, so the way they were looking at that is this, this was manageable and it's something they could deal with. So one of the districts, uh, I believe it was one district, went out and painted 70, 73 routes, uh, edge lines on 73 routes in 2009, uh, 1,138 edge line miles there, looked at before data and after data, and did this empirical Bayesian analysis. And of course, that's kind of the accepted practice now when you're doing safety analyses, and they found these reductions. Without getting into the numbers specifically, you can see there's been, there was a 15% reduction in total crashes and 19% reduction in fatality and disabling injury crashes. One was significant statistically, one was not. Um, but I tell you what, when I see 15 and 19% reductions and 24% reductions for lane markings, I'm good to go on that. I, you know, statistical or not, that, those are big numbers. Uh, one, another one, just to throw out there, again, there's lots of different CMFs in the CMF Clearinghouse. And uh, these two actually are not in the Highway Safety Manual, but are in the CMF Clearinghouse installing edge lines. And you can see they're split out between tangent and curved edge lines. And there are three stars out of five, because each one of the ones in, uh, uh, in the CMF Clearinghouse is ranked from a zero to five stars. Uh, you can see on the tangent, a 6% reduction in all crashes, and on curves, a much bigger, that we get back up into that 20, 25% reduction again uh, with regard to curve uh, crash reduction. This is all crashes. So once again, nothing special about these things. There's lots of other ones out there. You just want to apply the ones that are relevant to your particular situation when it comes to the CMF clearinghouse. Wider edge lines always comes up. And again, just have thrown one CMF out of the clearinghouse on this, um, installing, and you gotta be, look at these countermeasures really closely. So the countermeasure that's here uh, from the CMF Clearinghouse is installing wider markings without resurfacing. And there are a lot of wider edge line CMFs in uh, the CMF Clearinghouse. And so there's some from four to five inches, four to six inches, all kinds of different kinds of situations. This one shows a 22% reduction for uh, fatal serious and minor injury crash reduction uh, on principal arterials, freeways, and express or principal arterials, other freeways, and expressways in rural areas. So what you want to do again is check out those crash reduction factors or CMFs in the clearinghouse and apply the ones that seem most relevant to your situation. Um, of course, again, that's a big reduction. Other things we can do on curves, just to kind of throw this out here as a, uh, some potentials, is of course reflectorized barrier. Uh, you see that 
some different versions here. Uh, I don't think there's any CMF, CMFs or CRFs on these, but again, just better delineation. Other things that are out there, some of which one of these is in the, in the CMF clearance house as far as I could find it, uh, are these there's inline, in lane pavement markings, which is the upper version, uh, optical speed bars or speed reduction speed bars, which is the picture on the bottom right. Uh, again, those, those dashes get closer together, make you appear as if you're going faster, uh, coming up on a curve. So it's really about speed reduction, which hopefully will improve safety. Uh, both showed some small, what I call small speed reductions in the studies I've seen, meaning five miles an hour or less. Um, the inline pavement markings are uh, in the CMF clearinghouse. And here's a funny thing about the CMF clearinghouse. Read those abstracts connected to those links. Um, the CMF that is shown on inline pavement markings on the clearinghouse actually has the author in the abstract saying, but we don't recommend people use the CMF. So I'm not even going to repeat it here, um, but they will put stuff like that in the CMF clearinghouse. And if you didn't, hadn't read the abstract or hadn't looked at the little note that said use with caution because it's a very small sample set, um, you might not kind of pick up on whether you should use it or not. Right now, it's the only one in there, so sometimes we have to use what we, what we have. Uh, the optical speed bars, if you want to know how to get installed those, those are in the METCD, the installation uh, of uh, what they call speed reduction pavement markings are in Chapter 3 of uh, the METCD. So just wanted to throw those last two slides out there as there's other things that can kind of be done on curves, and no doubt there are other countermeasures with regard to pavement markings. Uh, we have a poll now. Uh, Jamie, did you want to discuss polls or? Yep, absolutely. So I'm going to move everyone over to the poll right now. While we are doing that, if you do have any questions, please go ahead and put those into the chat pod on the left-hand side, and after we take care of this poll, we will get back to those. Our first poll question for you is the MUTCD has standard and or guidance statements on the use of centerline and edgeline markings that include which of the following? Daily volume, functional class, rural urban designation, traveled way with, all of the above, none of the above, I don't know or I don't remember. We'll give everyone just a few seconds to go ahead and do that poll. And while we are waiting on those answers, Keith, one question that did come in for you is, do you know where the 6,000 and 3,000 thresholds came from that you discussed? Right. So those have been around for quite some time. Um, and from what I understand, and uh, I've not kind of gone out and found proof of this, is that when uh, uh, a federal document comes out, they have to do an economic analysis on its potential impact. It's my understanding that some of these lines that are being drawn from a volume point of view are based on economics. That does not necessarily mean they actually take into account safety. And uh, so that's my understanding, again, based on people I, based on uh, uh, input I've gotten from people I've talked to uh, that kind of do this kind of training. So it, it looks like everybody's finished the poll, and it, it is all the above. Uh, basically, they include functional classes, the art, you know, arterial collector, uh, both the rural and urban, and of course, travel way with comes into it also, along with daily volume. Jamie, did you want me to answer um, the second question too? Yes, please. Okay. Um, so the, Michael, the second question, just you know, if you want to read it out just so everyone else knows what it is too, please. Okay. Um, Basically, Michael Williams uh, says, I agree with the utility of edge lines, but CMF 87 and 88 for placing centerline markings have CMFs right at one. There are a few very few studies in the U.S. on centerline use, but, all, but studies in Britain show centerline removal resulting in slower speeds, significant crash reductions. And yes, Michael, that uh, says, do you have any other data which supports the use of centerlines? There's operational reasons, clearly, and separation reasons and whatnot. Um, you're exactly right. Studying centerline addition is, can be difficult because we put them on almost every roadway in the United States. Um, so studying them, would have, you'd have to find roads that don't have them. And I've, I've seen at least one of probably the British studies you've indicated 
and you're, you, from what I understand, I, I agree with what you're saying. Uh, but yes, center line studies are a tough thing to do uh, from a safety point of view. So hopefully that answers your question. Okay, moving on to signs. I'm just waiting for that. There we go. All right. So roadway curve signing, uh, again, a little more information on this, uh, whoops, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about the METCD because it did change when it comes to what they call horizontal alignment signs uh, between 2003 and 2009. Uh, I believe the section's the same, but don't quote me on that. The 2C02, uh, the use of warning signs shall be based on engineering study or engineering judgment, and 2C06, which is horizontal alignment signs all the signs we think of as curve signs. And in 2003, there were a lot of maybe used, maybe used, maybe used. Um, I believe, again, the th thinking with changing it in 2009 was to try to get some consistency. And in 2009, again, you can see the same statement from 2CO2 is still there, uh, but the one in 2CO6 has changed to basically say uh, these signs uh, in advance of horizontal curves on freeway, expressways, and roadways with more than 1,000 ADT that are functionally classified as arterials or collectors, uh, they shall be used in accordance with Table C-5 based on, and they talk about speed differential. In the end, it's the speed differential between the, the speed on the approach and your advisory speed, advisory speed I should say, uh, and determining which one represents that uh, approach speed the best. Uh, whichever is higher, uh, or again, the prevailing speed. So it's statutory, posted, 85th percentile, or prevailing, whichever, uh, whichever is higher or prevailing, I should say, with, and comparing that to the horizontal curve advisory speed. Um, I give the same explanation, which is why I can, the three and the 6,000 that Jim Gaddis asked about, um, I have the same explanation verbally about the 1,000. I, again, I wasn't in the meeting when these numbers were discussed, but there's all kinds of really good reasons, some of which you're going to see today, to have these signs out on roadways uh, because this table may also be applied on roadways with less than 1,000 vehicles today. Uh, but you can see the turn signs, the curve signs are in that top row, speed plaques, chevrons, exit speed signs, ramp speeds, and you can see the recommended required uh, optional uh, pods there for the speed differential 5 through 25 or higher. Um, I look at this again as, again, they're trying to get consistency. Consistency is good. We all would love more consistency on curve sign usage, um, advisory speeds and whatnot. Uh, and to me, this is best practices at this point uh, for roadways. In addition to, again, the statement I just read on the, the other slide. So lots of states, again, states and localities looking at these particular roadways because that's a shell at that point shall follow this uh, uh, table. Uh, support statement, one other thing that changed between 2003 and 2009 was a discussion of what's called established engineering practices to set advisory speeds, speeds on curves. The accelerometer is still there, the design speed is there. What changed was, and again, we could have a whole training on how to use a traditional ball bank indicator. Uh, the 16, 14, and 12 is different than the one number that we've had in the past to, to set advisory speed signs, uh, or I should say advisory speeds. And so a little bit different there uh, in support of setting advisory speeds. There's this also this great handbook out there on advisory speeds that Federal Highway put out in 2011, uh, which includes guidelines for determining when it's needed, identifying the appropriate speed, uh, study methods and determining advisory speeds, all the stuff we just talked, you know, the ball bank, uh, design speed approaches, that kind of thing, uh, are discussed in this document along with guidelines for selecting uh, the curve-related traffic control devices. So good document. You can see the website on the bottom there. Uh, take a look at that. It's been around for a bit. Some safety uh, information. Once again, lots of CMFs out there in the CMF clearinghouse. This one's a one-star ranking for just static signs with a 30% reduction in serious injury, minor injury, crashes. Uh, again, it's all just about taking it in, 
to perspective with the fact that it's one star out of five. Uh, but I believe it might be one of the few that we actually have on static curve signs in the CMS plan. There's other combinations, don't get me wrong. That's just the sign. There's other combinations I know uh, in the CMF coordinates. Take a look, uh, do some searching. It's a great, great resource. Different ways we can enhance things. We can double them up. Uh, you can see they also put some stri uh, striping on their posts here. You can light them up, put them above. And we can also use dynamic signs uh, in the, uh, once again, in the CMF clearinghouse, rural curve, 5% reduction on all crashes, all severities with dynamic speed feedback signs. I don't know that it includes both of these exact types, but that's, again, something that you can read the abstract about and things like that. I believe the one on the right was part of that study because I think that was one that I actually studied. <laughs> so, um, and that was one that just at, at a certain point would light up at you and tell you to slow down if you were, were going a little fast. Chevrons, again, an important thing to use. Uh, we have this range in this table between 4 and 25 percent. The one thing, uh, and again, you can see the four stars out of five um, by Srinivasan. Uh, and what I like to point out is this one, this nighttime non-intersection, 25 percent reduction, which should make sense. Uh, you're giving people, people better delineation, better way of getting around that curve uh, by putting up these chevrons. And what I do want to remind people of is, again, when, with regard to this table uh, and its application, chevrons here uh, recommended about you know, 10 miles an hour difference required uh, above that recommended required above 10 miles an hour, and then it gets into the required stages. Again, take a look at the uh, MV2CD if you haven't, read that section, because uh, there's a number of other sections on these other cur these curve signs that connect back to this table. One last thing in the METCD. There is a table, if you're not aware, in the METCD as of 2009 that uh, helps with placing the chevrons and the spacing of the chevrons on curves based on their on its radius and advisory speed. Uh, we didn't have that previous to this METCD, uh, which has been around now nine years. Uh, but if you didn't know that table was there and it can be of help, I wanted to mention it with regard to installation. Nighttime driving is an important thing. You know, during the day we have all these different cues. We've got lane markings. We've got you know, here a guardrail, chevron, roadside. At night, lot few, lot, lot fewer cues, right? So we want to make sure our signs are up and put together right, that they have good retroreflectivity, uh, and that we take care of them, we maintain them. Uh, you can see several instances here uh, on these signs where there actually is a sign, you just can't see them at all because they're not retro-reflective or any reflectivity at all for that matter. Shading matters too. There's actually a CMF I'll show you here on adding in the fluorescent yellow, uh, uh, the fluorescent yellow sheeting. Uh, and you can see even in this very gray kind of situation here that they really pop out much better, which is actually, in my opinion, where they're, where it's great. This is where you're you know, a situation where your eyes are working at their least efficiency because it's gray, it's not quite bright, it's not quite dark. Uh, and so you've got this in between, your cones and your rods are trying to act together. Uh, so it's good that they pop the way they do in gray, in gray situations. Uh, with the Chevron here, or sorry, the CMF, installing new fluorescent curve signs or upgrading existing sign curves to fluorescent sheeting, countermeasure, you can see these really high percentages, right? 18%, 25%, 35%. And if you look at that nighttime non-intersection one, which is only three out of five stars, but you know, they, 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 that's still good. Uh, you have that 35% reduction uh, for this better fluorescent signing or fluorescent sheeting. And of course, we need to look at orientation. That's always important. Um, you've got actually four chevrons at the top. And you can see two, kind of a third on the bottom. So that orientation really does matter. And of course, we have visibility too. Just want to bring this up. Got to see them to be able to react to them. And on curves too, of course. So 
Take a look at the CMF Clearinghouse. I've mentioned a few things here. Uh, hopefully they've been of value to you. And uh, there's a lot more out there, a lot more documents, a lot more resources that, again, if you need them, we can uh, look those up for you. Uh, but take a look and take advantage of them. So now we have a poll question. And the second poll question that we have for everyone is, nighttime crashes appear to be impacted by the use of chevrons to a larger extent than other crashes. True, false, I don't know, I don't remember. And again, while you're filling this out, we do have the chat pod on the left-hand side. If you do have any questions for Keith, you can put those over there. And when we finish the poll, we will uh, read those out to him. Okay, and it does look like everyone's had a chance to do the poll, Keith. I've uh, broadcast those yeah. results for you. All right, yeah, then you, it's true, uh, based on at least the two tables I showed during the presentation. Um, so Neil uh, had mentioned, again, and I, I, you, 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 I'm sure you're right. Fluorescent yellow is great, but a proprietary product for 3M, any other options or companies that make that sheeting, um, I couldn't tell you. If there's someone else out there on the line that, has bought uh, the brighter sheeting um, from another company and wants to let Neil know, please do so. Just waiting a second for the presentation to catch up with us. And as soon as that does happen, we're going to be passing the presentation along to Tori Brinkley. Um, but if you do have any questions for Keith, there will be three more question and answer sections. So you can include those in the chat pod. Um, and we will ask those at the time when we do stop. And Dana, I'm unsure, is it, uh, is it not loading for you as well, or is it just me? Sorry, Jamie, I'm not seeing it yet either. It's just cycling. I can see it. <laughs> you want me to go ahead, Jamie? Uh, yes, that would be great. Okay. We'll, we'll see, since I, I can see it. Um, I'm Tori Brinkley. Uh, we'll be talking about um, the role of friction to begin with and keeping along with the keeping vehicles on the roadway portion of this presentation series. So for friction, this was brought up in the NCRTRP Report 500 series, which is available online. Uh, volume 7 is about horizontal curves. And in there, it said that providing a skid-resistant pavement surface can reduce the likelihood of a vehicle leaving its lane either crossing the roadway center line or leaving the roadway at a horizontal curve itself. And pavement friction isn't new. Since the 1920s, it's been recognized that pavement tire friction can make a significant contribution to highway safety, particularly related to wet weather-related crashes. And the skid-related crashes are determined by many factors. You have tire issues out there, people that might have bald tires, um, poor tread on their tires. There's also weather conditions when you have rainy, rainy conditions or maybe sheet flow of water across the road, um, either in a curve or maybe in other locations on a road. There's also the aggregate friction characteristics, where the, the aggregate that's used in the paving material might be polishing to a greater extent than you'd want to, given the, the traffic volumes that you have on the surface of the road. Along with that is bond capability of the pavement binder itself, where the bonding of the aggregate to each other may not be withstanding the weather conditions or the um, traffic conditions along the road. In addition, there's also the friction demand that you have on the road itself. 
and factors contributing to friction demand are roadway geometry itself. Um, we might design a road for a certain traffic volume, certain design vehicle, but if people decide to drive it faster than you want, want them to or drive different vehicles on it, they'll be creating more demand between the vehicle and the pavement itself. There's also vehicle speeds. I'm sure many of us have driven through a curve with an advisory speed sign and we've maybe driven a little bit faster than that advisory speed, but we still make it through, but you're, provide, you're producing more friction demand between the vehicle and the pavement surface at that time. There's also driver actions that you might have out there, people that may not be paying too much attention while they're on the road and not realize that the curve is tighter ahead of them or maybe it's a downgrade to an intersection like we see here in this picture and um, they're just not paying attention. Then you, when you add trucks into that mixture, you also have to consider that the truck tire coefficient of friction is about 70% more or 70% that of the passenger cars, but they have a 10% higher friction demand because of course, of course they're a larger vehicle carrying a heavier load um, through the same roads that the smaller vehicles are driving on. When you look at the AASHTO horizontal curve design model from the, the Green Book, um, the side friction factor can be calculated from a formula using design speed, the radius of the curve, and the super elevation. When you look at a vehicle that's driving into a curve, around the PC is where the super elevation starts to increase. There's more demand on the vehicle um, as you're trying to um, speed or maybe break through a curve and also negotiate through the curve. This is where you might see more um, demand on the pavement surfacing and the polished pavement in those locations. But the basis for the AASHTO curve design model is really for driver comfort. Um, although the, the curve design policy stems from the law of mechanics, the values are used in design. They just depend on the practical limits um, on factors determined empirically over a wide range of variables that are involved. So that's why it sometimes might feel more comfortable or just as comfortable driving at a faster speed through a curve than at the design speed for the curve itself. In the AASHTO design assumptions, they look at a variety of things, but they also assume that the vehicles do not exceed the design speed and vehicles traverse the curve following a constant radius. I'm not sure if I've ever driven through a curve at a constant radius, and I know when I even make left turns or right turns at an intersection, I'm adjusting the radius that I'm driving to um, get into the lane that I want to be in after I make my turn. And several studies have shown that under real world conditions, both of those assumptions are violated, meaning that the driver does not follow the design speed and doesn't follow a set curve radius. And when those um, assumptions are violated, that's when skidding can occur. If you look at the circle of friction, um, we have accelerating, that's um, in the upward axis, braking in the downward axis, and then right and left turns to either side. A vehicle hopefully is staying within that circle um, as they're accelerating, making a right turn or a left turn, or maybe braking, because that circle is the limit of adhesion. So anybody who's staying within that circle, they'll be sticking to the, the pavement, sticking to the ground. But if they go beyond that, they could end up sliding. And that's where um, friction comes into play more. You look at it a different way. This is from NCRHRP um, Web Only Report 108. There'll be a link for it later on in this presentation. Looks at friction demand, speed, and friction availability. Um, as the vehicle speed increases, the pavement tire friction capability decreases just because the vehicle is going faster along the roadway. But at the same time, the friction demand of the vehicle is increasing. But the point where those two lines cross is where you could end up having the skid happen because the vehicle is going too fast for the conditions of the pavement and the tire to stick to the road. If you look at it in, re in terms of the AASHTO Green Book design factors, the heavy green line that you see here is just based on that formula that we saw earlier with the side friction demand and the speed. And we have two other lines, one for a radius of a 1500 um, curve and a 750 foot radius curve. 
the vehicle as they're driving, um, as they start approaching speeds that get close to that green line, they're going to have to be paying more attention to the curve itself, um, maneuvering through that curve. Um, once they hit that green line, they're, they could, for chance, end up sliding. And if they are going faster, meaning that on the 1500 radius curve, if they're doing 60 miles per hour, they could end up sliding on that. So this, I believe, Dana will pull up a video that's online to show an actual low friction road surface where they're using a skid trailer to test the friction in both directions along a curve. Hopefully. In the one direction, the trailer went through pretty smoothly. In the other direction, you see it sliding back and forth. There is a solution to that problem. After we have a couple poll questions. You want, okay, perfect. Did you want me to read the um, poll so, questions, Jamie? No, nope, I'll go ahead and do that for you. Um, but again, for anyone that has questions for Tori so far, you can put those on the left-hand side in the chat pod. Um, and our two poll questions that we have for you guys so far are, what issues can create pavement conditions that affect safety? Aggregates with poor friction factor, factors, high friction demand, which leads to accelerated pavement polishing, bald tires, wet pavement, all of the above, none of the above, or I don't know and I don't remember. And the other one is what forces are occurring past the PC that causes accelerating polishing? Vehicles breaking into the curve, transition from normal cross slope to SE, so not in full SE, in the curve, so experiencing side friction as well as braking, so experience circle of friction or traction rules, all of the above, none of the above, or I don't know, I don't remember. We'll give everyone just a few seconds to go ahead and fill those out. And a reminder as well, um, if you do want to watch any of the videos again that we will have, the links were provided on the slide and you can download the handout of the slides in the bottom left hand corner of your screen and that will give you access to those again after the fact. Okay, and it does look like our numbers have stopped, so I'm going to go ahead and broadcast these results for you, Tori, and you can address the poll questions. All right, it looks like everyone go. aced that first question and that all of the above, the aggregates with poor friction factors, the high friction demand, which leads to accelerated pavement polishing, bald tires and wet pavement, all contribute to conditions that affect safety. Um, for the second question, the correct answer for that one is actually all of the above, but it is a little confusing. Um, there, there is all of those, the, the vehicle braking into the curve just beyond the PC, the transitioning from a normal crown slope to a super elevation um, is happening at that time period right after the PC before you get into the full curve. Um, so people are adjusting to whatever the curve is going to bring to them. and. In the curve, they're also experiencing the side friction that we saw in the, that um, circle of friction where you might be accelerating then having to brake, but also having to turn one way or another. So, thanks, Jamie. And at this time, it looks like there aren't any questions in the chat pod, so we are just going to move you right back over to the presentation. Okay, and there you are. All right, so now we'll get into identifying effective methods to improve friction. Some of the common methods are using um, chip seal, 
um, which is generally a pavement preservation uh, method and uses fairly large rock on that. Um, there's micromilling and shot blasting, which is really just roughening up the surface of either asphalt or concrete surfacing to provide more texture to it. Uh, there's grooving, which you'll see mainly on concrete surfaces that you probably see it more on bridge decks where they're trying to provide a, a path for water to get off of the surface. Um, there's also resurfacing with friction course specifically. Um, Nova Chip is a registered uh, uh, ultra thin bond wearing course that is available out there. And then there's also HFST or high friction surface treatment, which is used in critical spot improvements. Any of these methods may be an appropriate solution depending on the problem that you have and what you're trying to address. When you look at road texture and the range of road textures, if you're in a vehicle, you'll feel some roughness or, or unevenness on a short stretch of road. Then you look at um, the tire with the pavement, that's what we call mega texture. So it's the overall tire as it's hitting multiple um, aggregate that's there on the surface. Um, when you look more closely at the tire and the, the aggregate itself, that's what we call microtexture. And then when you look at the texture of just the individual aggregate material, that would be the microtexture. Um, if you get into testing of uh, pavement or the high friction surface treatment material, there are tests that will um, look at both microtexture, microtexture, and macrotexture um, just to identify what your friction values are. So what defines the high friction surface treatment? It's really a pavement surface that has high friction values through a uh, variety of ash toe tests. And we also want that friction to last a long period of time. So we need to define what is the high friction value and what is a long period of time. So for high friction surface treatments, they're a pavement surfacing overlay system. They have exceptional skid resistant properties that are not typically acquired by conventional materials. Um, meaning the, the aggregate rock that you're using. Um, and they also retain higher friction property for a much longer period of time because they're not going to wear as fast as some of the aggregate that you might use in normal paving um, processes. It's applied with commercially available aggregate that you can find um, actually here in the US. Um, it uses resin-based products um, from different manufacturers to adhere that aggregate to the surface. And there's a variety of installation processes, which I'll go over in the next slides. They're generally applied in short sections to improve spot locations. So this would be, you're, you're not paving miles and miles with a high friction surface treatment. You may be doing anywhere from a couple hundred feet to maybe a couple thousand feet, depending on the length of your curve, or if you have a series of curves or intersections, um, wherever your friction demand um, is at. When you look at the HFST aggregate, it is defined as calcine bauxite. Um, it's been proven to provide the highest resistance to polishing and has a great friction durability. It's actually available now um, from Arkansas um, and is calcined in Alabama. For many of you who have used HFST in the past, you probably have received aggregate that's come over from China or India. Um, so Hopefully, with having this material available in the U.S., it'll make it easier and maybe a little bit more um, economical to use. The HFST binder, um, those are uh, two-part resin systems, and they're all proprietary blends. So when you look at the cost of HFST, this is where probably the majority of your cost is going to. You either have two-part epoxy, polyester, or acrylic blends. They're generally mixed on site. They have their own temperature and humidity specifications, both for the temperature they need to be at for being mixed, and then also for the ambient temperature and humidity for being applied to the road surface itself, so that it will cure um, properly and adhere to the pavement surface. For the installation, you can apply it manually, um, where they mix it in barrels or buckets. Um, pour it down onto the asphalt and then use a notched squeegee so that you have a certain um, specified thickness of the binder spread out along the road. And then the aggregate is tossed onto that binder by hand. 
There's also automated installation where you use a machine that will do the majority of the mixing um, of the binder material itself and also then the application of the aggregate. Um, there might be some limited hand or squeegee work going on to make sure that the coverage is just right for the binder along with making sure that there's not any um, thin spots with the aggregate. And next we'll see a demo video of uh, HFST that was installed in a parking lot um, using the uh, fully automated system, both for the application of the binder itself and then with the aggregate with a little bit of um, handwork going on to um, make sure their aggregate is covering the edges. Apologize for the jitteriness of the video that you might might have seen, but as Jamie had mentioned in the, the PDF, um, those links are in there so you can go back um, when you have time and view it to your heart's content on that. As I mentioned, there are HFST specifications out there. There's a provisional um, AASHTO spec uh, just for high friction surface treatment. And in that spec, it requires calcine bauxite. That is the only aggregate that's mentioned um, for high friction surface treatment. Along in that specification is a requirement that the um, minimum friction number be 65 when using the AASHTO um, 40 mile per hour rib test under the AASHTO T242. Um, yes. um, I am not a materials expert. I only know a little bit about the testing that has gone on, um, but 65 is a fairly high number, but there are some states that actually require um, a higher friction value um, upon completion of the installation of high friction surface treatment. PTI had run some friction test numbers back in the um, early 2000s. Um, out on concrete pavement. So they did a three-run average with a skid number um, using the tests for a skid number at 40 miles per hour. The wet value found on the concrete pavement was about 52. And then they um, did three runs on HFST and found the wet value to be 85. Regardless of the speed, the stopping difference was uh, 25 to 30 percent um, shorter on that HFST. And we have a third of four videos that Dana will show, um, which what you'll see is not calcine bauxite in the red. It's actually a granite. Um, this test was done in, over in the UK using the same vehicles, traveling at the same speed, breaking at the same time. And you'll see how the one traveling on the red stops much shorter than the one that's on the standard asphalt. So if you could run the video, Dana. Tori, one moment. I'm having just a little bit of technical difficulty. And if you can't can't run it, I described it so the participants can go view it later on. Okay. <laughs> Not sure. 
are you on? Yes. Corey, what do you see on your screen? I just see a share my screen right now. It's completely frozen. It's not allowing me to make any. Okay. One second. Be able to see the video now. Sorry. No. It's trying, but it's not happening. Okay. Amy, I'm completely yeah. locked. All I see is the uh, blue background for the safety center. Okay. We'll just go back to the presentation, and then we'll have to ask everyone to watch that particular video um, afterwards. Sorry about that. I know a question many people Can ask is how see. long does... You ready for me to move on, Jamie? Yes, sorry, you should see your, your okay. slides again. And I know many people ask, how long does high friction surface treatment last? And really, the most significant issue is the existing pavement condition. The picture that you see on this slide, there is some cracking in there. You can fill that with crack sealing. Um, however, if it was alligator cracking or if there were potholes and patched potholes in there, you'd want to have somebody come out to evaluate it to make sure that um, it would be able to last. Because really, anything that's underneath the high friction surface treatment could end up reflecting up through the top of it. They are expecting 10 plus years based on the test track results and some of the current project experiences. Um, other states and local agencies have been having out there um, since HFST first came out um, with Federal Highways as an EDC initiative, um, I think under EDC2. And it also depends on having a good specification and a good installation. Following the AASHTO specification and making sure that, that it is installed properly, whether by manual installation methods or by mechanical or automated methods, should mean that it will last a long time. Um, you do have to be careful of the, the temperature that you have out there, both ambient and the pavement temperature, and make sure that it's wet because um, that binder will make sure that it's not wet because um, that binder will um, react differently with uh, different temperatures, um, different humidity levels, and you want to make sure that the material is going to stick to your existing asphalt um, or concrete pavement and that the aggregate that you're placing on top of the binder will also stick to the binder itself. So if you see what the finished product looks like, um, this upper left picture on the left hand side you see the existing pavement and on the right hand half you'll see the HFST installed on it. Um, with the close up you can see with a quarter just how big or how small the, the little three millimeter aggregate pieces are for that calcine bauxite. And then the last two pictures show some final installations. Um, in both of these the existing pavement markings were protected by um, duct tape being placed down so that only the lane was, was getting the high friction surface treatment on it, and you didn't have to come back through and do a restriping over a short section. So why use HFST? Really, as we saw, in, uh, pavements in curves receive the shear and tensile forces as you're accelerating or braking and maneuvering through a curve, and so that's where that friction demand is going to be occurring. Um, and the high friction values allow the HFST to resist polishing better than other aggregates. Um, 
And if it's properly placed with the binders, um, you should get uh, at least 50% embedment for the superior performance. Um, that's why the temperature outside comes into play. If it's very, very warm outside, the binder might start to set up quicker and the aggregate won't be able to sink down into that binder or adhere to it. There have been some studies, um, this is one from TTI that uh, came up with the recommended distance ahead of the PC to begin that HFST application. So you're trying to get them to stick to the road before they get to that PC and into the curve itself. And as you can see, the, the distance um, before the PC depends on the approach speed um, and the curve speed itself. So as your approach speed increases and your curve speed decreases, you're gonna have a lot more lead time um, for that HFST application before you get into the curve. There have been some studies um, uh, where HFST has been installed on horizontal curves in regards to the operating speed, and they really did not find any significant change in the speed of vehicles going through there. Um, I don't think as a in a vehicle that you would notice um, the, the road surfacing itself, I think I have heard anecdotally that motorcycle riders do like it because they'll stick to the road a little bit better um, going on a curvilinear alignment. And so we have a couple more chat pod questions. We do. We have some chat pod questions for you and then we also have some more polls. So I am going to ask again if you do have any questions for Tori, please put those in the chat pod and we'll get to those just in a second. And then for the poll questions, the next two we have for you is what kind of aggregate is used for a high friction surface treatment? Granite, calcined bauxite, um, basalt, slate, I don't know, I don't remember. And when installed correctly, how long will high friction surface treatment last? One year, two years, five years, 10 plus years, I don't know or I don't remember. And while everyone is filling those out, uh, the first question we have for you, Tori, is um, I'm familiar with shot blasting prior to placement of a new surface course, but not as a friction enhancement strategy. Given the results of shot blasting, I would assume its life as a friction enhancer to be short. Do you have any information on the life of shot blasting as a friction enhancement strategy? I do not, but I'm sure I can find somebody who would have um, something on that. Um, and yeah, it would not last very long, I would imagine. So I'll make a note and do a little research. Um, the next question we had for you is when selecting a mitigation measure for wet weather crash locations, how often do you find that it is a drainage problem and not necessarily a friction problem? I personally haven't found um, or looked into that, but I know that would be something that you should examine, especially if you're going to have, if you do have an area where there is sheet flow of water going across the road, you might want to look into the drainage as well um, or what's going on through there. Um, but that is a good question and hopefully should be taken into consideration when you're looking at locations for HFST installation. Um, and at this time, I have ended the poll questions and broadcast those results if you'd like to talk through those, and then we'll go through the last couple questions for you. Um, looks like the majority of you did get it correct that uh, calcine bauxite is the aggregate to use. Um, there have been other, other countries, other states that have looked into using other material, and that UK video that you'll see offline on your own um, they used granite instead, but granite does not have as high a friction value or longevity as calcine bauxite. And then for the second question, um, again, looks like the majority of you did get that one correct. Um, in the studies that have been going on and the test track, um, they have been seeing uh, 10 plus years of uh, life out of the high friction surface treatment. It really will last just as long as the pavement surface underneath it. Um, so if you if you put it on an, an older pavement surface that might have some cracking going on, those cracks may eventually reflect up through that high friction surface treatment. Um, but in other locations where they know they have a good surface that they've installed it on, it's been lasting 10 plus years. 
Uh, the next question that we have for you, Tori, is with the implement implementation of high friction surface treatment on a section of road, should the pavement underneath the HFST newly installed or can it be an old section of pavement? It can be an old section of pavement as long as the, the cracks um, along in there and the overall pavement condition itself um, are in fairly good condition. I'll have a couple of resources shown in the, the third section of this presentation that you might be able to refer to. You can also install HFST on new or fresh asphalt as long as you wait at least 30 days for those oils to cure out. Um, again, those are, I don't know if that is in the AASHTO specification, but they are in the other guides and FAQs that are on the um, FHWA site in regards to high friction surface treatment. Um, another question that came in for you is, does snow plowing tend to shorten the use, useful life of high friction surface treatment? From what I've heard, the snow plow plowing, um, actually from some snow plow operators, they found that their blade actually gets a little bit sharpened by the high friction surface treatment. Um, I'm not sure if that's more anecdotally that I've heard that or if there's been an actual study on it. Um, but you know, as long as you don't have any lumps or bumps in there, it, it sh they should just be able to plow and not affect the life of the HFST. And then the next one is more of a comment, but on the same, um, same topic with the snow, is that Alaska has noticed that high friction surface treatment is not holding up as well to studded tires, um, seeing loss of aggregate in the wheel paths. Uh, we know our first sites may have suffered from poor installation, but for those states that allowed studded tires, it may factor into your decision on use of high friction surface treatment. Do you have any thoughts or comments on that part, Tori? I think that's a, a good observation, um, and I think that is something to consider. Um, I know I'll make a note of it just to be able to contact or um, talk with other states that I know that have studded tires where they might also have HFST in those areas because um, I know studded tires can um, really degrade your pavement, um, making those ruts in the pavement um, within a couple winters, it seems. So um, good observation, Matt. Uh, the next question for you is, does HFST increase road noise due to the surface texture? I don't think it increases the road noise. Um, when I've driven across HFST, I don't really notice it from inside the vehicle, and it's very tiny, teeny tiny aggregate. Um, if you think of it as a very coarse uh, sandpaper um, and your tire going across it, it's not going to be like rumble strips, a noise of a rumble strip. Um, it's just going to have a, a different sound, um, could have a different sound outside the vehicle, but I don't think they've done any noise studies on that. Uh, and the last one that we currently have for you is, does pavement markings degrade the friction values of HFST? Um, I don't think they do. Um, they can be, the existing pavement markings can be protected, like I mentioned, um, through the use of putting duct tape over them to, to protect them. Um, and if you install it on top of the, the HFST, um, it shouldn't make a, a difference. You're really trying to capture the wheel path of where the vehicle is at, not so much um, being right on the center line or the edge line um, for a vehicle. So um, we don't usually take the um, friction tests um, along a pavement marking area either. So. Okay, and All I right. think at this time that Dana was going to attempt to pull that video back up for us. Dana? Okay. All right, let's give it a go. Fingers crossed. Thanks, Dana. And if you view these uh, videos on your own, 
they should play very smoothly and you can play them over and over again to your heart's content. All right, I'll go into the, the final portion. We'll describe the safety benefits of high friction surface treatments. And you really want to look at what are your agency goals and expectations. Um, primarily HFST uh, being used at high crash locations, um, usually looking at the wet weather related crash locations, but then also you can look at high friction demand locations. Um, for some states or agencies, they're looking at a systemic safety um, process for the use of high friction surface treatment, so looking at risk-based or preventative action where maybe those high demand locations are based on certain curve radii, um, ADT, uh, speed limits that might be out there as well. Um, for some of the um, expectations, at least in regards to operations, you know that it's not going to change your operations. Um, people might still be going a little bit faster than you want them to, but they'll be able to stick to, to the road a lot better than they used to. And then the, for the longevity, um, you do get a, a fairly good return on your investment. Um, you do have to be conscious of what uh, state your underlying pavement is in um, and for any concerns for replacement in the future with that. There are some guides out there. Um, ASHA has a guide for uh, pavement friction, and there's also the uh, NCRTRP web only document 108 that I mentioned earlier. Um, they look at the different crash types that can be addressed by improving pavement friction. These, of course, would be the wet weather type crashes, um, also in curves where people might not might have a problem negotiating through a curve, and then other skidding locations, essentially where people are going too fast for conditions or maybe not paying attention to what's ahead of them, be it a tighter curve than they're expecting or a, an intersection might, might um, be hidden around a curve. So the strategies for reducing crashes or where can friction benefit the safety, as we've mentioned again and again, um, horizontal curves are a, a great location. Uh, approaches to intersections um, where there is going to be more demand between the tires of a vehicle and the pavement as they're coming to a stop, especially if they were approaching too fast. Um, and then you, you throw grades in there, whether related to curves or intersections. You might have people that are uh, traveling downhill, maybe a little too fast, maybe in a truck, um, and then having to stop um, on a short notice. Um, also in locations where there's marginal friction caused by weather, wet weather, um, you should look into or consider what your drainage options are if you have water that's always going across the road. Um, and then there's uh, where there's friction values not compatible with the approach speeds or the geometrics. So maybe in a location where you might not be able to go through and do a reconstruction um, at this point, but maybe putting down high friction surface treatment can get you to the point into the future where you have money to do something more with the road itself. There has, has been a couple effectiveness studies done. This is one from Federal Highways back in 2014 where they looked at a variety of ramps and curves. Um, when they looked at total crashes on uh, ramps, they saw a 35 to 52% reduction in crashes. And on curves for total crashes, it was a 24 to 30 when they looked at just wet road type crashes on ramps, they saw a 79 to 86% reduction in crashes. And on curves in wet, wet road crashes, they saw a 52 to 63% reduction. So for a spot treatment, um, that's something that not many people will notice that anything's been changed on the road itself. You get a great return on this. Kentucky also looked at um, their before and after. They had 70 locations where they installed high friction surface treatment. All of those were curves except for one, which was an intersection. As you can see between their before and after, especially for their wet weather type crashes, they saw a 90% reduction. Um, and then a total average overall, they saw an 87%. So while high friction surface treatment is really great for wet weather type crashes, it is still beneficial for any type of crash that's happening, um, even in on dry pavement. 
There's the Florida guidelines that I mentioned earlier. Um, they get into project selection, materials, and construction. Um, it's a very nice uh, and handy guide. And through their, their experience, their total crashes, they saw um, a 40% reduction in overall crashes and an 83% reduction in just wet weather crashes. So um, great benefit cost. Now we're almost to our final video, which hopefully will run um, pretty fairly smoothly. This is a Pennsylvania success story just outside of um, Wilson, Pennsylvania. We have a couple collector roads through here that have fairly high volumes. Um, we have an intersection within a curve itself, so you have people that are making left turns, right turns within this area. And you'll get a bit more description in the video itself. If you can pull that one up, Dana. We are very excited about using high friction surface turn. We chose this particular curve because it's a unique crash history. There's a majority of crashes were occurring in wet conditions. In fact, over a three-year period, there were 26 crashes. Since I've been here at the Chief of Police, uh, this intersection has been very problematic for us. We frequently would have to park a marked unit there with the emergency lights on to try to slow people down. It was not the speed that the vehicles were traveling. It was the road surface being wet that contributed to the accidents. We contacted the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation, spoke with uh, Steve Ohowski, an engineer, and we worked together to come up with some kind of a solution. I've been doing uh, low-cost safety improvements for over 10 years, and I've never seen such an immediate positive response to a safety treatment. In our use of high-friction surface treatment on curves, we've seen a day and night difference in accident reduction and even elimination. Quite simply, it stops crashes from occurring. Absolutely consider this road surface material. Uh, this eliminated our accidents. Since the material's been applied, uh, we've had, I believe, only one reportable accident at that location. So it, it basically eliminated all our accidents. Thanks, Dana. I, I hope everybody was able to hear the dialogue. Um, that's more important than seeing the video itself, but you'll get a chance to view it on your own afterwards. Um, sorry about that, Tori. I decreased the volume just a little bit because I could hear the echo as well. So I'm sorry if the full effect didn't come through. That's OK. The audio is the more important thing for that one. <laughs> yes. As you can see with their, um, their location, the three years prior to the installation, they had 26 um, wet weather related crashes that happened out there. And the skid number on the road itself was 22. So that pretty much explained why people were running off the road in that um, curve. And the police would always have somebody stationed out there or near there to address anything that would happen. So after the installation in 2012, um, they had one crash um, that was as of, I believe, late 2015. And the skid number increased dramatically up to 75. So um, great benefits for them, um, great reduction in the number of crashes. The last one I'll show you is the California success story. This is uh, US-199 that goes between I-5 out to US-1 on the coast. Um, in this location, uh, it's the 4080T. There's a high truck volume through here, um, log, mainly logging trucks. Um, it's a very tight radius curve, 280 foot, um, less than quarter mile long. They had 30 wet weather crashes over a period of 44 years, um, which was actually 10 times the statewide injury rate and 18 times the statewide total rate. So you can see from the picture on the right, um, they, in, they had already installed uh, double chevrons um, stacked on top of each other. They doubled up the curve warning signs through there. They also, I believe, increased the curve warning signs a little bit. They made use of um, an open graded friction course through there. 
they also installed a centerline rumble strip um, through this location as well. So after the point of doing all of these incremental improvements, they're looking at doing a realignment. But as you could kind of tell from that picture before, this road is on a ledge. It's also right next to a wild and scenic river. Um, and then the uh, mountainside goes up on the other side of the road. So they're looking at an environmental and design time frame of about two to five years, um, just because you're in this environmentally sensitive area. The construction duration doesn't seem like it'd be that long at six months, but the roadway would have to be closed um, for both directions, leading to a detour of about eight hours, because um, there's not many roads that are available or really welcome um, traveling for the public to go from the inland valley out to the coastline. And the cost was over $14 million to get all of this done. So they looked into using high friction surface treatment, which they found, well, we can do the environmental and design review in about four to six months. The construction duration would be about 10 working days, and we could do that under flagger conditions, alternating the traffic in each direction, and it would cost about $250,000. So, in 2012, they went through, um, they ground up, ground out the, um, the centerline rumble strip. They put in the um, AC back in there, let that cure, and then they applied HFST in this section. Um, and by mid-2015, there had been no reported crashes for that installation. So um, great improvement on that. So for high friction surface treatment conclusion, it's uh, HFST is not a pavement treatment that happens to have safety benefits, but it is a great safety treatment that happens to be a pavement. Um, and to be applicable, it still must provide the function of, of a pavement for du durability, but also greatly reduce the crashes um, for a significant period of time um, and have a high friction value associated with it as well. And for one of my last slides, just try to remember you know, with pavement friction and crash risk relationship, um, this is also from that web-only document. Um, essentially, if you can double the skid resistance, you can cut the crashes in half, which I think is a great thing to consider. So two final questions. Do we have two final poll questions for everybody? And one more time, this is our last question and answer section. So if you'd like to put any final questions over into the chat pod on the left-hand side. We'll address those here in a second. Uh, our last two questions for you is, does every curve need HFST? Yes, no, maybe, I don't know, or I don't remember. And which curves need HFST? No curves, tight radius curves, curves with friction demand, every curve, or I don't know, I don't remember. Well, we're giving everyone a few seconds to do that. Um, it looks like, Keith, this, this question that's in here is actually for you. It says, single vehicle crashes dominate the safety statistics of low volume rural roads. There's information available on alcohol involvement, but do you have other information on the root causes of these crashes? In particular, do you know how many of these crashes are due to temporary inattention? The reduction of these crashes by wider lanes and shoulders implies to me that inattention may be an important root cause but I am unaware of any studies on this topic. Yeah. Um, so there are studies out there on distracted driving. Uh, I haven't been recently looked into them, so I can't give you exact studies at this point, but um, I know that more and more people are studying that, so I don't disagree with your implication um, that inattention is the reason rumble strips, you know, help to uh, people are distracted in a variety of ways. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I, I can't point you to an individual study at this point. Sorry. Thanks, Keith. Um, and Tori, at this point, I've gone ahead and um, ended your polls and broadcast those results for you. All right, so for that um, first question, does every curve need HFST? No, that every curve does not need FHST, but better friction might be beneficial to that curve itself. 
um, moving on to HFST when you find a greater need for it, which kind of leads to the next question of which curve needs HFST. And the correct answer is the curves with friction demand. So this could be a tight curve, this could be a, a normal curve or a not so tight curve. But if there's a whole bunch of friction demand going on in that area, that's where you're going to want to have um, better friction that HFST might be able to get for you. And the last question that we have for you before we close up the presentation is, I don't remember my chemistry well, but what does calcium mean? And does the HFST surface treatment um, surface freeze thaw at different rates than untreated pavement? I'll answer the second part first. I don't think there'll be any difference with the freeze-thaw um, than you would have for other types of pavements. The calcined, I believe, and I'm not a materials person, but I believe it's related to um, uh, you're heating it up to um, harden it, and it's something that's been used in um, the um, manufacture of aluminum, per se. Um, other than that, I'd have to go in and look it up a little bit more for what specifically calcined means. This last slide is from my presentation and it just includes some links to Federal Highways, um, Pavement Friction website, ATSA's HFST site, um, some other, uh, another guideline related to speed management, and then the uh, friction fund is really just something for fun um, that, that does happen to mention friction in it. So. Hope you enjoy it. Perfect. And just to go ahead and wrap up today's webinar, uh, the learning outcomes for today in this webinar, you have learned to summarize what the NUTCD says about pavement markings and horizontal curve signs, to describe some of what we know about the potential safety benefits of pavement markings and horizontal curve signing, to describe the role of friction in roadway departures, to identify effective methods to improve friction, and to describe the safety benefits of high friction surface treatments. Uh, just a few announcements for everyone. This um, webinar that you're listening to right now was part two of the Rural Roadway Departure Countermeasures. Part three will be held on December 18th from 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Mountain. Uh, in January, we will be having on the 31st a webinar on the framework for bikeway designations on rural roadways. And um, you can also find part one of our rural roadways departure countermeasures on our website at the second link. And the first link is the webinar that was originally done um, in September to introduce the EDC5 Reducing Rural Roadway Departures webinar. So you can also watch those two as well. And again, all of these links are available in that presentation handout in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. We do also want to remind everyone, we hope you're all joining us the first week in December for our National Summit on Rural Road Safety. At that, we will be having three training workshops, one on an introduction to safety culture, one on systemic safety, and one on low-cost safety improvements. All of those will offer CEUs. We will also be having our day and a half summit, which will include a lot of great presentations by different organizations. Um, we will also have in there 10 different topics that you can choose from to come do mini workshop sessions. We're really intending this to be an action-oriented uh, summit and to empower you to continue to um, put in, in to, sorry, to implement um, different solutions for rural road safety. So we would love to see all of you. Um, we are ending our early bird registration fairly soon, so make sure you get those registrations in so that you um, can take advantage of that cost saving. And for everybody, if you have any final questions, you can contact Keith and Tori at the emails that are shown right now on your screen. And I do want to thank everyone for joining us. And Keith and Tori, thank you so much for presenting today. We do appreciate it. And everyone have a great afternoon.